Stay safe online with private internet access. With unlimited data and a ton of encryption and authentication methods, PIA has your VPN needs covered. Check them out at the link below. Hey, what's up guys? Sleepy Modder here, back with another video. Now, recently we did a quick little video, although I didn't think it ended up being very quick, but we did a quick little video setting up a Windows file sharing server, and it was relatively the steps you needed to take to set that up. And I got a number of questions also too, regarding the setup of VirtualBox for using on Linux, Windows, Mac, and all those types of different things. And I thought, well, I do that all the time. Why not go ahead and share the tips and tricks that I picked up with you guys as well? Now, just like our other video that we did, we're going to be jumping over the computer in just a minute, but before we go ahead and do that, there are a couple things you will need to have prepared before we jump into the actual steps. First off, you need to grab yourself an ISO of whatever operating system you want to use, whether that'll be a Linux ISO, a Windows ISO, or if you're going to try this with Mac OS, obviously a Mac OS ISO. It doesn't need to be a bootable memory stick, it just needs to be the ISO file, so we need to grab that. Once we've gone ahead and grabbed that, if you're going to be using Windows 10 like we're doing, we're going going to grab it from the uh, Windows creation tool or if you have access to Microsoft Imagine or TechNet, if that's still even around, you can go ahead and grab your ISOs from there. And then all we need is a copy of VirtualBox, which can be all be found down in that description box. Finally, you'll want to actually have a system that you can run a virtualized system on top of. So we we'll need at least 25 or so gigs of hard drive space and at least eight gigs of RAM. So there is at least some for our host system and also to some for our client. And also too, we'll need at least two CPU cores. One for again the host and one for the client or the VM that we're going to be running. Once we've got that, let's jump over to our computer. Alrighty, so we've jumped over to my desktop PC that we do have right here. Now, just for those wondering about specs today, we do have a test bench set up with a 6-core 12-thread Ryzen CPU, 32GB of RAM, and a GTX 1080 Ti. So, all in all, a really great system for setting up a virtualized system on it. We've got plenty of cores, plenty of RAM. I've also thrown in a couple extra SSDs for plenty of storage. Really, this guy is ready to go. So, as we've set up, uh, as we can see here, rather, we've got ourselves a virtual Box. Now we are running uh, VirtualBox version 5.2.22, uh, though that being said, these instructions will apply for a lot of different versions of VirtualBox because the interface has been the same for basically I think since I started using it like 10 years ago, so it's been quite the same for quite some time. So basically that's it. I've gone ahead and also do grab myself a Windows ISO that is uh, saved in my documents folder, so I can easily grab that, which I just also do recommend you do, or if you have Windows desktop icons enabled, which obviously I don't, um, you can go ahead and uh, save it to the desktop. And yes, for those playing along, uh, I am running Windows 8.1 on a Ryzen CPU. Uh, it seems to work alright, uh, mainly because I hate Windows 10. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started here. So obviously once you do jump in the user interface, we are greeted with this menu and we can click on the new button and it will walk us through the wizard. Now as we are setting up Windows 10 here today, we'll say Windows 10 and then we'll call it uh, video just because well, we're doing a video right here. And as we can see, uh, it has auto-populated what version. Now, if we were to go ahead and go Mac OS, we can see it auto-populates with Mac OS. So this is really smart if we go Linux, and then I think if we go Mint, it also too grabs us for well, what we could do. Now, I don't know if it does Mint uh, natively, but either way, you get my point, it auto-populates. So we'll go back to uh, Windows 10, I think we did last time, video. Um, oops, V-I-D-E-O. Um, uh, so basically, again, that just auto-populates. Now, if you are using a version that doesn't have auto-populate, you just need to click this drop-down and grab uh, the most obvious version for you. Now, if your version of Windows has come up, maybe you're using, say, uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, although there is 2012 here. Um, but if you are using a version of Windows that isn't here, you can always do Windows Other. Same thing with Linux. If you're using a different version, you can select, let's go down to Linux and go, for example, Other Linux. That is also to an option here. But we're using Windows. We're using Windows. 10 and making sure it's 64-bit and our ISO 64-bit, we're going to hit next and we can punch in our RAM. Now, uh, Windows generally likes to have at least 4 gigs of RAM and 4 gigs will get you by, but today I'm going to go ahead and use 8 gigabytes of RAM because, well, I've got 
32 gigabytes of the stuff, so why not go ahead and use it? Now, uh, for that, we're going to go ahead and key in right here, uh, 8192, which is the correct measurement for 8 gigabytes of RAM. You could type 8000, and that's technically speaking 8000, but technically 1 gigabyte is not just 1000, it's actually a little bit more. So, we're going to use 8192 to get ourselves 8 gigabytes of RAM, and also too, we're going to create ourselves a new virtual hard disk. Now, if you're importing one or you already have one set up, you can choose the other options, but we're going to go ahead and click that guy. We're going to make sure it is set on the VDI mode. You can use VHD or VMDK. Uh, they're just different ways of having your virtual disks kind of set up, and they have different uh, parameters and settings for it. But VDI is the most flexible that I like to use, and I also do like to use dynamic so that we can put it on a drive without taking up all of your drive. Now, if you use fixed size and you type in 100 gigabytes, then you're just going to have a 100 gigabyte file on your drive. The benefit of having dynamic is when you set a size, it's more of a limit. So uh, you can just save as much as you get up until that limit versus having the entire drive taken up. So if you've got a uh, 500 gigabyte drive and you portion off 200 gigabytes for your VM and you have fixed, well now you've just lost 200 gigabytes. Whereas if you have dynamic, sure it can use 200 gigabytes, but it's not going to allocate it straight away. So I like using dynamic. For that, we're going to use, uh, let's say we'll use 100 uh, gigabytes of space. This is going to be the name of our drive, and it's important to click this little green icon arrow thing and select where we're saving it. Especially if you have a smaller SSD as your hard drive or your main C drive, uh, you're going to run out of space real quick. So I'm going to click this button and I'm going to navigate over to my computer and I'm going to save it onto my super speedy uh, NVMe RAID array and then we're going to call this one VM, oops, VM drives and save it in here. As we can see here, the name of the drive, I'm just going to leave it as is and it's saved onto my super speedy NVMe RAID array. Uh, which will be very fast for this video, and I can go ahead and click Create. Again, if you want to save it on a hard drive or something different, just select where you're going to save it. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, great, it's been made, I can smash on the Start button, let's get into it. Actually, not yet. First, we need to go to Settings and set up some other options. So the first thing we need to do is go into General, and we're going to go over to Disk Encryption. Now, if you want to set up Disk Encryption, you can enable that. You can play around with your different uh, encryption methods. We can do, for example, AES-256 keys. We can type in our passwords and stuff like that. For the sake of this video, we're just going to leave Disk Encryption off uh, just to keep things nice and simple. But again, if you are storing stuff that you don't want other people to access, Disk Encryption may be an option that you want to go ahead and have enabled. Uh, the other tabs here we don't need to worry about too much, which will allow us to jump over the system. We can see that our 8GB of RAM is right here. Now for me, I like to enable EFI when I'm doing Windows 10. I can also do enable the hardware clock if I really want to, but I may want to play around with time later. But for me, I like enabling EFI for Windows 10. just allows me to take advantage of some of those EFI slash UEFI kind of features. For processor, I'm going to go in here, and because we have our 6 cores, 12 threads, I'm actually going to go ahead and allocate uh, let's say four cores for our system. Uh, in terms of the actual cap, we're going to leave it here to 100%. Now, if you are on a laptop with, say, two cores and four threads, what I recommend you do is set it to one and then enable the cap at about 80 to 90%. This just stops uh, the VM locking up your laptop, and I've had some really bad experiences with a dual core laptop being completely locked up by just a single VM. Pulling down your cap really, really helps if that is something you want to do. But for today's video, I have a desktop, I have plenty of cores, we're going to put on four cores right here. We're going to finally jump over to acceleration, make sure our little sections here are ticked, and if you do know any specific settings that you do want to use, you can change them here. But I'm just going to leave it as default because honestly I don't need to play around too much with what we're doing here. Next up we're going to jump over to display, we're going to make sure the video memory is cranked up. Now I do have three monitors, I've just bought the uh, Ryzen box and stuck it under my desk with my triple monitor setup. So for me, for me I'm going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to also to enable acceleration for 2D and 3D and just again make sure that is cranked up so we get the best acceleration. Now do note, this is not actually passing through the GPU, rather it's virtualizing a chunk of it. So if you're thinking about enabling this to get like 100 FPS in your favorite game in Windows 10 or Windows 7 or whatever, unfortunately, that's not how it's working. Uh, the other two tabs we don't need to worry about because we're not doing anything with remote displays or video capture. And then the uh, last thing that we do need to come down to, or I guess the second last thing, uh, is we need to set up the storage. Now, as we can see here, we already have our hard drive that we already selected. 
However, we need to define where the ISO is located. So we can see here the CD drive, and this is much like when we build a system and put our Windows installer disk in the computer. We'll go over here, click the little Windows CD drop down, and we'll choose our ISO from uh, the drive. And as we can see here, when this window pops up, we have a Windows 10 ISO. Now I've gone ahead and actually have a dedicated folder on my computer uh, for ISOs. So I've got a ton of different ISOs, but for me, Windows 10 64 is exactly what we want. We can click OK on that window and that's almost about it. Uh, we can go down to networking here and just make sure our networking settings are correct. Usually you want to have it on NAT, but because I want to have access to other computers in my network, I'm going to have it on bridged adapter, which means it will act like having another computer on the network. It just kind of bridges over the adapter, meaning I get the same IP address, same DHCP settings and all that kind of stuff as the rest of the computers on my network. If we have it on NAT, it will kind of create a network with inside of the computer. So it have its own IP addressing scheme, or those kind of things will be different to the rest of your network. And especially if you want to follow the guide on how we created a Windows storage server, you will want bridged adapter. So I'm going to choose that. You can go ahead and set up other adapters if you want to set up more, but for today's video, we're just going to keep it on one adapter. We're going to keep it on bridge and that's about it for the settings. The rest, you can go ahead and have a tweak. You can play around with user interfaces. You can play around with shared folders and that kind of stuff. But the settings that we set up right here, if you follow exactly what I've done uh, on your computer, provided you have the same specs and abilities, uh, it will just work. So we're going to click OK and then we can click on Start for our system. Give it just a moment and we will pop into the VM as we can see right here. We get this little baby window and it says press any key and we'll press any key. Just hit the enter key right there and it will start to boot. Now do keep in mind if you don't select EFI mode, I believe by default VirtualBox just boots from the uh, ISO and that's pretty much fine. And then we're ready to go ahead and start installing Windows. Now if you want a definitive guide on installing Windows, you can go ahead and actually follow our guide on how to install Windows, but I'm going to quickly do this and we'll jump back once it's done. So we've jumped into our Windows install and hang on a second, what if you're not exactly getting this screen? What if you've gone ahead and click start and it's just a blank screen? Well, don't actually worry because there's a couple things you'll need to do before you can actually jump into Windows. So first thing you need to do is actually shut down your computer and reboot into the BIOS settings. Basically what's going on here is you do not have virtualization enabled. Now, for some reason, many pre-built computers and also to laptops just have this feature turned off unless they're a workstation or business uh, class of computer. It doesn't mean they can't run it. It just means for some reason the OEM thinks you don't need it and they've just disabled it by default. So again, we'll go ahead and reboot into the BIOS of the system by hitting the delete key on most computers or in some cases it might be F10, F12 or some computers from a while ago uh, still have an access key. But once we get into the BIOS, we'll want to dig around for a little bit until we come across a setting that relates to virtualization and we can en enable it. Once we've enabled it, we'll save our settings, jump back into our computer, and then we can fire up VirtualBox once again, and it will work just fine. So do keep in mind, if you followed everything I've done and you're not getting it to work, just go ahead and check your virtualization settings, because nine times out of 10, that is what's causing your black screen or causing VirtualBox just to crash, because you don't have that feature enabled. And boom, we've jumped into our brand new Windows install now. Obviously, you can see it's a little bit of a small window if we hit our full screen button. Uh, that's a bit of a problem. So there's a little bit still that we need to do before we can actually start using the computer properly. Now, don't get me wrong, the system works just fine. You can jump on the internet with the network settings we got. You can do things like get rid of Cortana, which is the first thing I always do. But all in all, the system does work, but it's just not exactly the nicest thing to use on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're gonna go ahead and go over to uh, Devices and we will insert our Guest Editions CD. Give that just a moment to go ahead and pop up and then we can go over to our File Explorer, go over to this PC and boom, our Guest Editions is here. We'll double click into that, run the 64 editions or whatever the application launcher is to go ahead and run it. We'll go ahead and follow these simple on-screen prompts will just basically smash next until it is done and this will allow us to run. Now, basically what we're doing here is allowing us to do a number of things and we'll install all those things from doing things like making the computer screen full screen, allowing us to set up drag and drop, controlling things like the host keyboard, uh, shortcuts and those kind of things. It's just really, really handy to have. We'll go ahead and finish that guy, let it reboot and then I'll show you the benefits of installing the guest editions. 
And boom, we are back into our system. We can go ahead and hit full screen. And if we go over to a display settings, we'll be able to actually go ahead and set a full screen. Oh, there we go. Took just a second to register. Sometimes you need to go in the settings, but we can set a full screen resolution. And no matter what size we drag it down to, let's say this size and we'll make it wider, give it just a moment, it will always scale properly. So that's one of the benefits of having guest editions installed. Now we can also to go ahead and do other things. So for example, we can do things like share folders properly, we can share our clipboard properly, and we can set up drag and drop correctly. Uh, all these settings do kind of technically work with our guest editions, but really work a lot better with guest editions installed. So now that we're here, we can do whatever we want. We can go ahead and do things like go over to our computer, check that all of our storage is here. So we can see we had a 100 gig drive, we've got 99.3 gigabytes usable, which is perfectly fine. If we wanted to add more drives, we could go back over to the machine, go to settings, and then go over to, where is our storage folders right here storage and we can click on the little plus button up here uh, or down here if we wanted to add a different controller that is all able to be done but as the system is running you can't do that on the fly unfortunately and our computer is ready to go don't get me wrong there is a little bit of lag because we aren't exactly passing through a full GPU as so unfortunately that is not really a feature of this system but all in all we are ready to go ahead and run so there we are the pretty simple steps to go ahead and actually set up VirtualBox once you kind of get the hang of it and learn where all the settings are, it can be a really easy thing just to quickly set up and deploy new systems. Now, we didn't exactly cover transferring them from system to system, but where we went ahead and actually saved the files, you can just sort of pick them up and plonk them into another system. Now, we did cover Windows 10, and as I did mention in those particular steps, uh, you can tweak things slightly to run things like Linux or even Mac OS, though again today we more focused on Windows 10, as that is something that a lot of people may be using. Maybe they don't like Windows 10 on the system and just want to keep it in a VM uh, like I do, then that is also to an option right there. But all in all, if you are having any issues, do hit me up down in that comment section. I'll do my best to give you a hand. And also to down in that description box again is the links to things like VirtualBox and the Windows creation tool and all the ISOs and bits and pieces you may want to go ahead and grab for making yourself a VM. But otherwise, guys, thanks all for watching and I'll catch you all in the next one.